Um, and now we're starting the first session. First, the terms web vivir, summa kawanya, vivir bien, summa kausai, communicate ideas and practices of community well being that evolve among Andean cultures over centuries and millennia. Widely varied contemporary expressions shared among ground. First, web vivir is not about accumulating more material work, nor about getting ahead of one's day. Second, when we will, is about seeking and sustaining harmonious interdependence among human neighbors and with non-human nature. And third, thinking of Buenos Aires in plural attempts to capture the respect for diverse cultural richness central to this idea. Today we young passionate debates about how this long evolving lifeway life can be named, translated, institutionalized, or scaled up into this world. Some argue against making those efforts alone. We start with voices from several other countries describing diverse attempts to apply and advance when we need. So the first speaker is Silvia Begal Galde. Uh, sadly, she's not here, but she sent a letter and this is her brief bio. Silvia Begal Galde, Ecuadorian feminist, is very sorry not to be with us today, because the U.S. consulate in her country did not grant her a visa. She accompanied companies us in thought and sends her affection and desire for fruitful affection that the last good living in her She sent this letter, which I'm going to read in Spanish. Queridas, queridos participantes de la 67 Conferencia Anual del Centro de Estudios Dominicanos de la Universidad de Florida. Con mucha pena no podré estar presente en la conferencia para nutrirme del intercambio de ustedes y todas sus riquezas que traerán a este evento. No se me ha concedido la visa para viajar a los Estados Unidos, lo que considero una lamentable expresión de las prácticas de mal vivir que ponen barreras entre los seres humanos de distintos países. Sin embargo, he aceptado la generosa invitación de Susan Paulson para compartir con ustedes algunas ideas a través de esta ponencia que será leída por la doctora Tania Saunders del Centro de Estudios Latinoamericanos. So, here we go. Oh, okay. uh, the title of Silvia Vega's uh, presentation is Suma Causa y Feminismo, términos para ser los significados. Cool to get to do this. I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> um, Suma Kause is a polysemous concept. So is feminism. Contestation of the social political system in which we live, including patriarchy, as a constitutive and inseparable part of that system, differs according to the perspective that we adopt. Some diverse perspectives and forms of contestation are generated around Buenos Aires and around feminism. For some years, I, Celia Vega, have, have been doing research on how different conceptions of summa causa fit and interact with various understandings of gender. Antonio Luis Hidalgo and, Patrice, and Ana Patricia Cubillo classified perspectives mobilized by the term summa causa into three different positions. The socialist status, the indigenous pachama, pachamista, and the ecological post-developmentalist. In the first understanding, summa causa is an Andean version of socialism with an emphasis on state management of resources to, arc, to achieve the main objective, social equity. This perspective on Suma Jose constitutes an alternative development paradigm. For the other two perspectives, Suma Jose is an alternative paradigm to development, thanks to its core opposition to the prior orientation of unlimited economic growth that preys on nature. A fundamental difference between these two is that the indigenous Pachamamista perspective sees Suma Causa as the heritage of indigenous people, while the ecological post-developmental perspective 
C. Sumat Kelsey, Kelsey as, an, as a contentious project built through co-participation of groups struggling against capitalist extractivism and degradation. Changes in gender relations and systems are not central to any of these visions of Sumat Kelsey. I'm reading the, she emphasized these points in bold, so I'm trying to <laughs> give an emphasis when I, I read it. Um, however, we can think about these three understandings or manifestations in association with three different conceptions of gender. Latent in the socialist status version of Sumat Kelsey, Kelsey is a vision of gender based on the liberal feminist notion of equality of opportunity among individual citizens. Indigenous understandings resonate with the gender vision grounded in the harmonious com complementarity of men and women. The ecological post-developmental visions of Sumat Kelsey uh, connect with the understandings of gender put forward by both feminist eco economics and communitarian feminism. The socialist status concept of Sumat Kelsey and equal <coughs> opportunity gender politics. This is the part that she's going to focus on next. Uh, the gender principle of equality of opportunity aims to obtain rights for individual women that are equal to those rights enjoyed by men. This perspective puts emphasis on allowing women to access the public sphere, such as employment, education, politics. It is concerned with reducing discrimination in relationships between men and women, rather than addressing oppression. The idea of equal opportunity is central to liberal feminism, dominant in women's movements and prevalent in state policies. One problem with this vision is that by focusing on public spaces, it dismisses the need for changes in private spaces, and particularly in the reproduction of families, communities, life worlds. A deeper problem is the assumption of an androcentric Western order as the universal referent of rights, and the goal of all women is inclusion into that order. Uh, now she's gonna move on to a focus on the indigenous concept of Sumat Kelsey uh, and gender com complementarity. The cosmos is represented as a conjunction of the masculine and feminine among indigenous people in the, of the Andes. This conception, transposed to the relationship <coughs> between men and women, appears in the, in the idea of Chacha Wormi, which is the man woman couple among <coughs> Amaras and the Quarry Warmi among uh, Kichwas. In Amaira communities, the man, Chacha, and the woman, Warmi, become Jaki, human being, through mar marital union. A single man cannot be Jilakata, that is, authority in the community, and neither can be a single woman be a uh, mata, ma, mama taya. In this tradition, men and women assume different daily and ritual functions, which are perceived as complementing one another harmoniously. This idea of Indian complementarity is sometimes presented as an ancient feature of indigenous life that has served 500 years of colonization that has survived, sorry, 500 years of colonization. <laughs> Others argue that this feature has been undermined, distorted, as a result of colonial acculturation. For others, the concept of complementarity is a mobilizing idea, not an empirical characterization of current cultural practices, but rather an <laughs> ideal to be continually built. The notion of gender complementarity as basic to when we did is characterized for limiting attention to women's and men's personal autonomy. Moreover, the necessity of heterosexual marriage for a human to be complete and to live well complicates the experience of being single or the acknowledgement of sexual diversity. 
now she's, she's going to focus on uh, the ecological post-development developmentalist vision of Sumakause and the conception of gender and feminist economics and communitarian feminism. It is more difficult to find a conception of gender in the eco ecologist post-developmental discussions than in the other visions of Sumakause, but we can identify convergences with some positions expressed by feminist economists and by communitarian feminists. Feminist economics and Sumakausai both engage the conceptual category of reproduction of life, although they approach it differently. From the Sumakausai perspective, the idea of the reproduction of life deals with oriented production and consumption to satisfy human needs, community continuity, and ecosystem <laughs> equilibrium, rather than to accumulate capital. From the point of view of feminist economics, the reproduction of life refers to a category of unpaid labor, in many contexts considered women's responsibility. This labor serves to satisfy basic human needs, to support human and environmental health, and to reproduce family and community across generations, all of which resonate with Sumakose's uh, understanding of the concept. Both applications challenge Western economics, which has led to an instrumentalization of nature and the invisibilization of women's labor. And both perspectives propose to transform economic institutions presently geared toward accumulation of financial and material wealth into economies centered on the reproduction and thriving of life itself. Proceeding from criticism of liberal feminism, the project of communitarian feminism seeks to decolonize and reconstitute feminism in non-Western cultural realms by appropriating and reinter reinterpreting certain indigenous or local <coughs> practices and paradigms. They seek to recuperate community, not in existing forms infused with patriarchy and exploitive, uh, and exploitive relations, but as an ideal in the making that draws on deep cultural resources to transcend individualism and the state. Among vital cultural resources called up are defense of Pachamama, Pachamama <laughs> and harmonious relationships with nature. So in conclusion, divergent visions of Sumakause and of feminism briefly presented here coexist, clash with one another, and at times unite. Women's movements in our countries usually have sought to obtain from government some attention to their immediate agendas. As feminists, we can also impact debates over long-term visions and co-participate in strategies for social transformation by locating gender discussions on the horizon of utopias, such as Sumakausa, Negro, <coughs> and others. And she offers some ref uh, references if you all would like to hear. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Sanders, and also to Sylvia. Um, our second speakers, speakers uh, are Bernardo Hernández Umaña from Colombia and Carmen Dulce uh, from Spain. Bernardo Alfredo Hernández Umaña is the son of Bernardo y Elena, the father of Valentina, in love with life and a lover of nature. He's a professor and researcher of the master's degree in communication, development, and social change of the Universidad Santo Tomás in Colombia. His research has focused on integral development human rights and non-human rights. He's the author of the books Develop Development and Right to Development from Biocentrism and Complex Thinking and The Right to Peace Seen from the Complex Thought of Edgar Moran. The Nardo's presentation will be read by his collaborator Carmen Duce uh, and his her bio Carmen Duce has a daughter of 11 years old and a son of 9 years old and lives in Valladolid, Spain. 
She studied industrial engineering and works in the Convention Office of the University of Valladolid since 2007. as a team, so present as a team, and also Jose Maria is our <laughs> photo <laughs> commissioner. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Susan Carlson and the Center for Latin American Studies to invite us and to facilitate our participation and to make it possible this uh, such big experience to share experience with others and networking and try to change this world. No? I will run the, the, the communication, the presentation is about, well, I'm sorry, I apologize for my English pronunciation, I hope you understand, <laughs> but that there's also the PowerPoint that maybe it can be easy. Uh, we want to present some reflections from the International Colloquium on Higher Education, When We Build and the Grow, a space to reconsider the university of the first century it was held at the University of Santo Tomas in Colombia six months ago, in uh, 2017. The colloquium was organized by the team thinking the 21st century university as a territory for coexistence with researchers from the following programs, the Masters in Communication, Development and Social Change, and Masters in Planning for Development at the University, at the university of Santo Tomas in Bogotá, Colombia, and also the area for international cooperation of the University of Valladolid in Spain. We are working together one year, one and a half year ago. It was an invitation from Colombia just to think about the university and the and this and the challenge now. <coughs> so. The colloquium supported researchers, university directors, students, and activists to discuss proposals and experiences of higher education linked to when we live and the growth in Latin America and in Europe. Two central panels were organized from the university to the pluriversity, change and their debate, and experiences and perspectives of when we live in universities today. In the first panel, Universities recognize their historic roles as monopolistic sources of knowledge and the only truth, and began to acknowledge themselves as co-responsible for current environmental crisis. Resulting, resulting commitment to resist dominant educational models and to question ways in which knowledge is, is constructed and legitimated in responses to socio-ecological challenges has engendered efforts to incorporate initiatives and ideas associated with the growth, when we build, and interculturality into higher education. Even faced with urgent challenges, however, universities are not always receptive to epistemological and pedagogic innovation. We ask, <laughs> on which side are universities positioning themselves? with official development discourses or with alternatives to development. Numerous educational proposals have been advanced in conjunction with mainstream approaches to sustainable development. In the 2015 UNESCO report Reassessing Education Towards a Global Common Good, Professor François Xavier Pinel asks a more radical question. What education do we need for the 21st century? In our new generation, we need to support capacities for resilience and abilities to guarantee and preserve an essential right, life. With the growth and when we will expanding their epistemological and teleological horizons, universities assume a new societal role. Rather than a cloister for the production and transmission of superior knowledge shining in the midst of darkness, the university becomes a dynamic and flexible social organization that articulates diverse knowledge and actors collaborating to forge sustainable solutions. This shift opens a range, a range of alternatives for thinking of the 21st century university as a territory for coexistence. 
among note words with phenomena that have marked recent decades, decades in widespread indigenous emergency in opposition to the historic relation of these communities and the atrophy of their ancestral knowledge and practices. Struggles for rights and recognition of cultures and protection of life ways resist the power of colonizing and universalizing thought that has dominated much of state policy, institutions, and agents. The fight for valuation and recuperation of the indigenous wisdom has garnered relevance via the circulation of notions such as well vivir, summa causa in Kichwa language, and vivir bien, summa tamaño in Aymara. This circulation raises possibilities and also risks. In recent years, range of scholarly studies and publications have moved well vivir into reals of academic thought and discourse, away from the lived meaning of these terms in tangible social practice and interaction with the environment. <laughs> the idea of the growth arose with Nicolas Francesco Rotten 40 years ago as a negation of the postulates of environmental <coughs> economics, a branch of neoclassic economics proposing market mechanisms to manage environmental damage itself driven by expanding markets. Subsequently, the idea of the growth has resurfaced with Serge Latouche and others as a counterpoint to policies and projects that affix the adjective of sustainable to development, processes that are anything but. The growth looks for more radical solutions to growing socio-ecological problems of three levels. First, from an individual perspective, breaking consumer-based lifestyles. Second, at the state level, recovering the idea of the common goods. And third, from an international perspective, promoting an alternative idea of progress, not based on the accumulation of wealth, but on leading principles of good faith and goodwill. Interacting with other post development discourses, the growth seeks to nurture an ecology of diverse knowledges that can overcome in past resulting from hegemony of universal, universalistic thought. This ecology of knowledge is nurtured by the recuperation of ancient ways of knowing and being and by creative attempts to adapt and update them, exemplified in the incorporation of Andean ideas of well vivir and vivir bien into the constitutional text of Ecuador and Bolivia, respectively. Universities can facilitate plural processes of knowledge construction vital to support necessary transitions by embracing dialogue across ways of knowing and being, a move that calls for new politically aware and solidary relations between university and society, relations that move toward kings of epistemological justice advances by Guaventura de Sousa Santos. The very idea of a university as a mode of universalizing superior forms of knowledge is shaken by the concept of pluriverse. Pluriversity is grounded in social functions of knowledge, used for any by diverse pop people in the construction of tutors that fulfill collective desires, not market rights. The second panel of the colloquium highlighted unprecedented changes in the ways and meanings of education in Latin America. Examples include the Maya University in Guatemala, the Intercultural University of Chiapas in Mexico, the Maria Cano Pisan University in Colombia, among others. The emergence of Atia Yala Network of Intercultural and Community Indigenous Universities is evidence that these changes are not limited to isolated events, but occurring through Atia Yala and gaining strength through synergy. At Ixil University in Guatemala, for example, the curriculum is structured around three strategic axes linked to context, territory, and actors. First, development of the territory. Second, resource management and preservation of the environment. Third, Ixil history and culture. The decolonial term manifest in these higher education programs has begun to be institutionalized in Bolivia and Ecuador by their clear commitment to when vivir, vivir bien in the social and political horizon of national life included in their constitutions. 
We highlighted the state supported at the indigenous University of Bolivia, UNIBOL, which has high educational access. <coughs> Decolonizing education, socio communal education, educa education in productive systems that promote and the ancestral knowledge, intracultural and intercultural education, education in the modern tongue, and curricula that articulate theory and practice. However, there's still a long way to go. Across Latin America, many of these transformative educational initiatives reside little state support and find themselves undermined by market forces and interests. It is difficult for innovative institutions to obtain official recognition allowing them to issue degrees with discouraged enrollment, permanence, and the possibility of constructing intercultural dialogues. We are with that by empowering one way of knowing as universal, universal truth, higher education in Europe and the Americas has incurred a historical debt to other knowledges and other sociocultural practices. <laughs> education inspired by Guen Vivir and the Growth can help revive that debt by disrupting the hegemonic modes of knowledge production. This motivates us, motivates us to propose another phase of research, research entitled Communication for Good Living in Latin America towards the construction of intercultural dialects. Our objectives are to recognize the role of communication in cultural life, to recognize different systems and classes of local knowledge in Latin America inspired by the idea of Ethiopian, and to make practices of these local knowledges visible. In short, we want to make a proposal based in critical interculturality for the university of the 21st century. We invite you to join us in this venture, starting by participating tomorrow morning in workshop three on higher education to work with and the Good morning. Um, thank you for this mention manifiesto de educación como bien viene que se terminó el coloquio que acabamos de presentar de los resultados que se presentaron una de las líneas fue el, de los postulados en el manifiesto es la educación y el conocimiento como bienes comunes mundiales lo segundo la educación para la vida y para toda la vida tercero la educación crítica y para la construcción colectiva de otros modelos de civilización. Cuarto, la educación, en la equidad en la educación y la construcción de conocimiento. Y, y cinco, quinto, la educación más allá de las instituciones legitimadoras. Nosotros como docentes, como profesores, como padres, como hijos, como ciudadanos de este mundo tenemos una obligación y el llamado con este manifiesto es a reivindicar la educación como un bien común para todos y para todos. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Germín y Bernardo. Our final speaker is a young lady, German social philosopher Oscar Nieck said, When the continuation of reality becomes utopian, only utopias are realistic. Adrián has made it the quest of his life to research for insights about how radical social ecological features are constructed and how to pave the way from the politically impossible to the politically inevitable. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. I was hoping I could get this down there. Blue University shouldn't have a podium. <laughs> <laughs> Can I? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Let's start without microphone. I have a loud voice. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Good. Yeah, thanks. There's a mute button on it. 
I would like to start taking a poll. Thank you. I would like to start taking a poll. Can I please ask the supporters of Donald Trump in this room to raise hands? Come on, don't be shy. Only one? Good. That's okay. Personally, I don't like Donald Trump. I'm scared of him. And we should be. But there's one thing I'm more scared of than Donald Trump, and that is the lack of self-criticism by the liberal establishment, not only in this country, <clears throat> but across the global north. What is, why do I think, or why do we think, that there is this lack of self-criticism in the liberal establishment? In my view, I don't know if you will agree with me, the liberal establishment is so convinced of their moral righteousness and uh, that they've done nothing wrong, so self-reassured and disbelief, that they've stopped seeing the world, and instead they expect the world to see them. Now what does this have to do with anything we've been talking here about? Um, in the workshop we've had over the last two days with some of you, uh, the concern has come up repeatedly about not being too naive when talking about transforming the world. Transforming the world is not something we just would like to do. As we heard yesterday in the opening panel, it's something that we need to do. It's a survival imperative at this point. And if we're going to behave like the liberal establishment and stop seeing the world because we're so convinced that we have that we represent the right moral values and that we know the right strategies and that we're working with the right people, then my claim is the chance that we will transform the world is rather grim. Therefore, uh, what I would like to propose, can yeah. somebody help me please with the, from here I won't manage. Um, no, that is the... Well, the presentation is Discursive Synergies, that's the title, for a necessary dialogue, or pragmatic contributions to a necessary dialogue between Bolivir, human development, and degrowth. And I stress the word necessary, because of the reasons I've just argued for. It's necessary that uh, we take on the dialogue with those who are not necessarily in agreement with us. We've been hearing in the previous presentations about when we were seeking to lay bridges with feminism and with degrowth and with universities which are not always um, ready to take up this pluriversal perspective um, for different reasons, I would like to go into a particular dialogue here between three discourses, as I mentioned from the view, uh, degrowth and human development. When I say dialogue, I think we also should not be naive about this. Um, that doesn't mean that we need to convince each other. And here I'm drawing on Miriam Lang, who said this in the 2016 uh, degrowth conference in Budapest. It doesn't mean that we have to convince each other of our own tenets, of our own values, viewpoints. But it does mean that we need to see each other when thinking of how to act. Yeah? We need to acknowledge the presence of the other and see how this plays out in our own uh, ways of doing things. I would like to raise the bar even a bit higher, the stakes, and say not only need we to see each other, but we need to uh, acknowledge for the possibility that the other may be also a partner in this, uh, in this quest. Piece. So the next three slides are um, structured in a very similar way. They present each of the three discourses. I will not go in detail into it, don't worry. I would just like to focus, I think this is enough for us to have a conversation, on the key contributions which are at the bottom of each slide. And in the case of Tigros, something we've already heard about it, I would like to highlight those uh, key contributions that are particularly interesting for making my case, of course. 
Um, the first one is the centrality of the questions about the prevalent socioeconomic model. Yeah, this is this is the the key, the actual uh, dimension of degrowth. Uh, you call it social metabolism, questions of consumption, of production, disposal. That you can take different approaches to it. And the second one is that it does not only raise this critique, but there are, um, and this is insufficiently stressed often, there are a number of uh, packages, proposals, of how to uh, unbuild the growth dependent economy and transform it into a different thing. Yeah? Um, Federico raised the point uh, last night that degrowth is not to be conflated with uh, recession. It's not about bringing a growth oriented economy into degrowing GDP, it's about transforming this economy so that it will not experience a recession when there is no GDP growth. Thanks, thanks. In the case of Buen Vivir, um, the key contributions in, for, for, for the case I'm trying to make are that it highlights uh, elements of cultural critique of Western modernity. Yeah? And it does so from a perspective that is we could call it external to modernity, yeah? because it allows for um, for <coughs> subaltern voices, for these saberes otros, to have a voice. Yeah, saberes otros, which come from subaltern uh, groups, indigenous peasants, and so on. And the second one is that it offers offers a real lab at the macro level, which is quite unique um, for the implementation of or experimentation with transformative uh, ideas and practices. Despite the fact uh, that I think most of us in this room will agree that when we hear as a state project, if conceived as a state project, is a failed one, uh, that I mentioned I would like to highlight is the dimension of cultural transformation, which goes well beyond the state projects in Bolivia and Ecuador uh, to other social groups and also other countries. Lastly, uh, human development is, of course, not a discourse of transition, as Arturo Escobar uh, calls them, in the sense that what we hear and the growth are, it's rather a system imminent critique of the conventional notion of uh, development. Uh, we're all familiar with it because uh, of the UNDP work, the Human Development Report since the early 1990s. And for me, the main points here are uh, that it opens the discussion to the multidimensionality of human well being. And it gives a central role to the freedom of choice and public deliberation in defining what well-being means and in assessing that well-being. Um, human development has permeated, as we all know, uh, mainstream political thinking uh, internationally. And this, for me, is a key point why this is a useful partner for dialogue. Um, but of course, the conception of development uh, in this discourse does not fundamentally question this universalist pretensions or ambitions of Western political, social, and economic institutions. Um, next, please. And this is um, the last slide already, and it's the billion dollar question. We can speak in abstract of how uh, these three discourses can be complementary. My proposal, and again drawing a mirror in hand, uh, is that this complementaries, this complementarities need to be made fertile. <coughs> and to make them fertile, we need to identify particular talking points where, where this uh, three discourses can be articulated with each other. So this is just a proposal, and huh? this is a thought experiment. I would like to share it with you and uh, listen to what you have to say about it. We can start, uh, please give me three more clicks. I will right away start with my uh, thesis. My thesis is that uh, Buen Vivir is the stronghold in the front of the cultural transformation, degrowth in the material transformation, and human development in the political transformation of the world. Why and how? Um, I will start with Buen Vivir. Buen Vivir, as I said, opens dialogue of knowledges between traditions which were it had to consider incompatible with each other. Yes, thank you. Um, development and indigenous traditions were considered as antithetic. Now, all of a sudden, it appears that development requires indigenous traditions in order to legitimate itself. This is a welcome uh, evolution, I would say. I would say. 
as I also mentioned, uh, when we offer this um, external vantage point for the critique of Euro-Atlantic modernity and this large-scale lab to experiment. But of course, you will see in the corner, uh, upper left corner, an Achilles heel. Yeah? What is the Achilles heel, the, the weakness that I identify in Bolivir? That it very rapidly finds the limits in the structural material barriers of log in extractivist matrices in the countries where it's been attempted to implement as a, as a political project. And I think there is where degrowth has a big role to play. Why? Because degrowth offers a deeper understanding of the mechanisms that are locking in these economies into the extractivist matrices. When we will just raise the critique and says there is a problem with extractivism, extractivism is bad, but it does not really go in depth into figuring out how to get out of it. Yeah? Degrowth is stronger in that respect. That is my, my thesis. Um, it proposes a number of technical programmatic measures, and these measures are of varied ideological inspiration. Uh, the fear was raised also in our workshop by Alberto and others that degrowth is, uh, is a concept and is a discourse that can be easily co-opted by uh, other ideological, uh, non-emancipatory ideological um, positions. And this is true. But my claim is that uh, we should not necessarily shy away from engagement with this uh, because of what I said at the beginning. There is in Germany, for example, my Marhav my, my uh and in France, uh, there are people who are right-wing, uh, but they're for degrowth. Um, it's something to be discussed. Uh, and the cultural critique of degrowth resonates with the Vivir. Um, despite not being the main focus. So there's a complementarity there also. Now, what is the Achilles heel of degrowth? The Achilles heel of degrowth is that, well, it's a double one. Um, the lack of political leverage, on the one hand. We can try, of course, to make a degrowth party and compete in the political game. <laughs> My claim would be that, first of all, that wouldn't have too many chances of success. And second, even if it did, it would imply go into the political game and play with the logic of the political game. And that would deprive the growth of much of its critical potential and its mobilizing capacity. Therefore, I think it would be a better idea to acknowledge the strengths of uh, human development in that regard, which is already a politically established mission. As we said, um, it has opened this multidimensionality um, idea in the, in the definition of well-being. And it talks particularly well with one of the strengths of degrowth. There is a taxonomy of degrowth. I haven't gone into this now. Um, you can read it in the literature. I'm going to give you for you further if you're interested. Um, Matthias Schmelzer in Germany has elaborated this taxonomy, and he acknowledges that there is a strand of degrowth which is socially and ecologically uncompromising, yet institutionally conservative. He calls it the liberal reformist strand. And um, a concept that is Arising from this fact, for example, is the one of right to sufficiency. This is a concept by uh, ecofeminist scholar Ruta von Winterfeld. And the right to sufficiency says the following. Um, people who are willing to, to have a, a more sufficient, a, a, a life of uh, frugal abundance, are not really free to do so. Why? Because there are structural constraints. Try to live without a car in Gainesville. Not possible. It is possible in Berlin, but not here. Yeah? There are also other issues of social status, social recognition, and so on, that lock us all into a, a consumerist matrix, which it is hard to escape from. So we're not really free to choose a sufficient lifestyle, even if we wanted to. Therefore, if we pose the issue of sufficiency, not as a matter of constraint or as imposed asceticism, but as a matter of right, then we're talking the language of human development. I have the right to define what it's going to be. Yeah, nobody should be forcefully wanting to have ever more. This is the way she defines the rights to sufficiency. Of course, uh, human development has also an Achilles heel, and that is the blind spot regarding ecological and social economic limits, and the, this lack of engagement with the cultural critique that, for example, when we view rises. And there we close the circle, and we acknowledge that also human development then needs 
uh, the other two if it is going to become a transformative force and not a force stabilizing the status quo. Thank you very much for listening. About 30 seconds more, I would just like to introduce you to Alternautas. Um, I mentioned before that I think this panel is a, is a... One second, please. I'd like to show the previous slide, please. Previous slide. Oh, yeah. Previous. Previous slide. Previous slide. Yeah, yeah. Previous slide. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 ah, back, back, okay, okay. Yeah. Now, this is just, it's just a literature list in case you want to, uh, in the unlikely event that some of you want to uh, engage with this more from the comfort of your homes. Um, <laughs> present the next. Uh, I'm, I'm departing from the assumption that you will have had access to this, no? Uh, good. Uh, just. 15 seconds uh, to introduce you to Alternautas. I mentioned before that I think this is a panel about bridging, about building bridges. And Alternautas is a project we started with some colleagues um, in order to make thoughts on um, Latin American thinking on development alternatives and alternatives to development available to an English speaking audience, which is uh, largely not the case just because of the language barrier. So um, there is this platform trying to build. Uh, the bridge, I invite you all to uh, visit it and hopefully participate. Again, thank you very much.